so forgive the sort of glassy expressions. Um, but really just interested in what opportunities you guys see available in commercial space flight or commercializing space in general. Has anybody worked in uh, for a small business, for a large business um, that's, that's working on commercializing space flight at this point? Well, I'd like to tell you a little bit about, my name is Wayne Rast, I'm the Director of Governmental Relations for a new uh, 501c4 organization, which is a nonprofit advocacy group for setting up commercial space in the state of Texas. Uh, we just formed in the last three or four months. Um, we were already working with uh, Senator, State Senator Mike Jackson from this area, I know him well personally. Um, let me tell you about all my hats. I'm a Kemah City Council person for the last eight or ten years. I'm on the Galveston County United Board of Health. I'm AIAA Reaching Forward Deputy Director of Public Policy. I'm on the Houston Section Public Policy Group, and I'm part of this organization. So, I've seen, I've seen a little bit of everything. I've been an AIAA Congressional Fellow for a couple of years from back in the 90s. So I've seen it from the national level. I, I've seen government be a national program only. Uh, I've seen what we intended to do, starting with the vision for space exploration with Bush to turn low Earth orbit into something that private industry does. It really was part of the natural outgrowth of that. This isn't brand new. Um, this was not done, but that was the plan for it. And now we're finally seeing it for real. I know we were talking about commercial space industry with Jim Muncy and Dana Rohrbacher 15 years ago when it still had a giggle factor associated with it, but now it's for real. And now it's going to be different, making a, a difference. And all of the workers that are around here that have an awful lot of knowledge, operations knowledge, a lot of other knowledge, should not be just tossed out in the current arrangements, but we need to have that tap. That's one of the reasons why I got involved with this group. Uh, Hal co-founded with Rick Tomlinson from the Space Frontier Foundation, some of you may know him. Uh, we're here, as I said, working with Senator Jackson. We're working with some of the other, Larry, we're going to be working with Larry Taylor's office, John Davis' office. I've gone down to Austin already once um, to talk about uh, setting up a couple of important things for commercial space businesses, because Rick Tomlinson knows a lot of these folks personally. Uh, he has these, the leaders of these companies in his Rolodex. He talks to them frequently, and in fact, I have a little presentation I've made. If we can get an opportunity to get over, uh, I've got a, a flash drive, I can show the presentation that we offered. I actually have it on the board out there now. Uh, if we could split time with the space law lady here, I can <coughs> give you the presentation that I gave them. But I don't want to take this over, but I want to say I'm very uh, passionate about this. I think that uh, uh, we're going to be doing some stuff very directly to try to help uh, uh, Texas bring those kinds of, the, these decisions are being made right now. Once you build Boeing's things in Seattle, you can't move them again. The, the guys that have real money in the commercial space industry are making decisions right now. Some of them have already made their decisions. We're late to the game, but it's not impossible to change that. It would be ridiculous to give away Texas' natural advantages and things like spaceports down the line, all the way down the coastline. Yep. You get just above Brownsville, you've got a natural work to Florida. This stuff has been talked about for 20 and 30 years. You have all of the advantages of, of business in, in the state. We already have SpaceX here. We have Blue Origin working out in West Texas. Uh, we have uh, Ad Astra right here locally. We have an awful lot of uh, senior businesses that find Texas a great place to do business, but no one is advocating for and making sure that of the hundreds of obstacles they have to overcome to get this stuff off the ground, we smooth them out as much as we can. And we hope to find an awful lot of ways to make sure that those things happen. Rick Tomlinson talks to these guys. One of the things, the two things we're working on right now, the state has no money. So you can't talk about spaceports in the next two years. They're 20 billion in the hole. But you can do things like this. We're, and this is what we're actively working on. There's a liability law. Um, if you're going to be a space flight commercial operator and uh, the worst happens, uh, one of the things they're having difficulty with is, you know, you're already a rich guy, so you're a rich niece of the, of the dearly departed. If, the, uh, if, 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 if a terrible thing happens, you can sue these guys right out of business. So we a standard liability release law that basically says you know that this is a risky business. You know that upon signing this, unless there's gross negligence involved, you're going to be able to uh, be able to run a space flight or tourism business uh, and not be sued out of business. So that's number one. Number two is we're we're talking about something. And if you'll hear this in the future, you'll know where it got started. It's been done in a few other states. It's called zero G zero tax. And basically, you get rid of both sales tax and, and gains tax on products that are used for, for, for space program activities. Um, what we're going to add to it is payloads that are developed in space, products that are developed in space. So that will give Texas a Texas-sized leg up, or a frontier state after all, on getting off to that new frontier. So that's what we're going to try. 
to make happen. That shouldn't really cost anything. If you don't have any space businesses, you don't lose any money. If this brings space business to your state, you lose out on some nominal taxes, but they wouldn't have come without it. Uh, so from their perspective, Senator Jackson's perspective, and hopefully a lot of other folks in the near future, if we get uh, uh, done what we need to get done, we're going to be seeing more of those decisions made. Big Low is making their decision. Uh, they've already talked a little bit about Florida, but that's not entirely set in stone. And now Florida is backing out a little bit of their fla Space Florida stuff that they were uh, that they were working on. So we're still an opportunity. We're at the eleventh hour, but we can help make a difference. I'm sorry. I've, I've now taken full ten minutes out of there, but I wanted to You're let you know right. there's somebody working on that, and uh, we hope to be a big part of it. Excellent. Very good to know. <laughs> are you the gentleman that read the article in the newspaper about three months ago? Mm, yeah, I'm, I get in the news and a little yeah, bit here and there. Yeah. Um, so yeah, uh, possibly. Is some of this a carryover from the spaceport that they started down in Brazoria County a couple years ago? Well, actually, I can give you an interesting uh, storyline on that. Um, they gave about, the uh, under the economic development hat, there used to be a group called the Texas Aerospace Commission, which got sunsetted out of existence. But there, there was a smaller group under the government's economic development group that was called Aviation and... Um, Oh God, it's like aviation defense. I'm not sure they even have aerospace in there anymore. Um, <clears throat> that that uh, that's the what's left over of that. They came up with about a million and a half dollars, and didn't a they were a little early because the 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 industry wasn't far enough along yet, and b they didn't really know entirely what they wanted to accomplish. So part of the problem is they they set up three different places in the state. They kind of had three different ideas about how you get this going, gave each of them about a half a million dollars. And they did a variety of different things with those things. Some of them built uh, some uh, utilities to go out to their side. Some of them, the one in Brazoria County did most of their environmental impact stuff, uh, making sure that they got all of those approvals. And they expected the next round of money and the next biennium and the whole thing went away. So there, there were some folks a little, still a little mad about that. They felt like they got left high and dry. Well, Things that are funded at the will of the legislature get every. Uh, two, we all know about that here in NASA. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know how many, how many things have we stopped and started. There's the, uh, the, the presidential versus national space program argument. Yeah. Right. So, anyway, the, the answer to that is Brazoria County is still there, uh, and I'm not at liberty to say entirely uh, that there's been a little interest lately in taking up where the environmental impact stuff was left off. Uh, whether or not that's the absolute most, I mean, I'm an orbital mechanic, aerospace engineer type, so whether or not that seems to be my person to be the most logical place to do an equatorial launch is, is, is another, is a subject for another time. Yeah. But uh, anybody knows the orbital mechanics, go south. But, uh, but, you know, but with, with that said, um, there are some interest in that, and whether or not that really gets off the ground is going to be much more how much money is associated with the group, you know, backing this, and will it get any further? And the answer is, we'll see. But if we can make this state become what we call, in my pitch, a space state. Right now, commercial space entities do not view Texas as a space state. And in fact, we, because of the advocacy of, and this is, there's nothing wrong with this, we have a very good, and I'll say this on their behalf, we have a very good group at the, at the national level, uh, Texas comes together a lot across in bipartisan fashion to defend things in the state. And up until recently, the only thing there really ever was was a national program. So, you know, in defending human space flight and the nature of that business, we have been rather off putting to a lot of these new commercial enterprises because it was in our interest to make sure that all the money got channeled into the into the uh, previously existing way of doing business. And that way of doing business is now no longer viable in the same way that it was. So what are we going to do about that? And that's what I hope we can capitalize on That's a great lead into a discussion on what do you guys see as the major opportunities for commercializing space? What are, any ideas? Just throw them out, crazy things. Um, uh, space bulldozers, taking, taking defunct satellites out of uh, very valuable uh, geosync orbits, ones that ones that don't have the ability to deorbit. Excellent. Okay. Other ideas. Well, awesome. Well, near term, uh, you know, near term, obviously supplying the space station. 
Um, and we've got the COTS program out there with yeah. NASA that has already got uh, um, uh, SpaceX and um, Orbital OSC, Orbital Sciences, uh, with their vehicle as cargo vehicles that uh, are perform, you know, are intended to perform the same function that the Russian Progress vehicles do. And beyond that, we have a commercial crew initiative, which won't be there for a few years, and there's, there'll be a gap there, which unfortunately, as as it, as it currently sits. And uh, commercial crew is something that you know, he mentioned several of the contenders there that. There's about five or six companies that are all trying to throw their hats into the ring to uh, be able to send crew up to space station. In the interim, uh, you know, the, whenever a U.S. astronaut goes up there, they'll go up on a uh, Russian so Soyuz vehicle, yep. but it costs $55 million a seat. So obviously there's, there's some business there to take care of. And a lot of people look at that as sort of uh, kick-starting the industry the way uh, airmail <coughs> kick-started the airlines back in the, in the 30s. What is there, I mean, airmail was obviously, didn't have anything to do with people, I guess, specifically, when it, I guess, kickstarted the aviation industry. Is there something, a similar kind of technology capability that can only be accomplished in space that could have a similar effect on anything but the space tourism business that would kickstart well, space yeah, there's, travel? There's, there's, many, there's many things. There's, I mean, tourism is just one part of it. There's, there's resource gathering, which we haven't gotten into yet, although we are blaming on asteroids and making gestures in that direction. Um, um, it's my, my, my passion is, is asteroid mining. But um, then, then, then there's the communications aspect. Obviously, satellites are up there already, but there's so much more we can do. Um, and then there's the obvious, obvious research that can only be done in energy. I, I can think of half a dozen things off the top of the head that, that are that are interesting potential items. There's orbital repair, uh, refurbishing of, of satellites. If, if you can get uh, refueling. Uh, refueling, if especially in geosynchronous orbit, where an awful lot of the lifetimes are now dictated on the amount of, of of fuel available because our electronics have gotten so good that they can keep going and extend life. Uh, so if you had something up in geosynchronous orbit, you could easily get. Uh, that to be a commercial enterprise. There's a space debris, uh, 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 anything from space tugs, there's been a variety of different items come out, space nets, and you've got to clear away an awful lot of debris, it's getting worse over time. That's something that's a world-based problem, so there should be enough interest in that theoretically uh, to fund quite a bit of activity. Any kind of thing that sets up, if we don't have a real heavy lift launch vehicle going out, um, Awesome. On an interplanetary basis, we're going to end up needing to do fuel depots um, because some of the smaller heavy lift vehicles based off of uh, uh, some of the potential ideas that are being floated around really won't get you the lift necessary to make those viable. So if you're going to do that, you're going to have to have a big propellant uh, storage. There's an awful lot of very important technical details that need to be worked out in that particular area, but that's that's... That's another one. Any person, anybody who comes up with a drop them in situ uh, resource development thing for the moon or for Mars that can either do propellant um, work from in situ materials and, and, and can drop them and leave and let it go for 20 years and by the time you get there all the return fuel is available is a massive commercial uh, opportunity. There, there's just I guess going so for at least half a dozen easily. The, 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 um, the new gold rush. Yeah. So the mining one was one that's been talked about. UN keeps talking about real planetary defenses. Well, if we can come up with a real uh, way to make a space tug, have an, uh, an extra utility by attaching on these things and, and pulling its orbit out just a little bit to do long-term avoidance maneuvers or whatever way we're going to deal with planetary defense, we keep playing with that as though we care about it, even though it only involves something as minor as the extinction of species on Earth, uh, including the highest order, we hope, on Earth. But, you know, <clears throat> there's, there's, a big, there's a big deal there. Are we going to get serious about it? If we do, there's a potential there for, for markets. I won't get into the more esoteric stuff like uh, elevator lifts and, and all of those things, because right. we're still a little space solar power. Everybody talks about it. It's still not a viable option. But... If those things eventually work, uh, there's a huge amount of commercial uh, opportunity, and it's wide based, and it's will cross many disciplines. The power generation and storage alone is huge. We have a comment from the internet. 
I had a question asking about lunar platinum or propellant depots, platinum, titanium, etc., commercial space tugs, propellant depots, and options for commercializing and capitalizing those resources. Yeah, the, they're huge. The, the, just just the, the dust on the, on the moon can be used to make concrete and, and uh, paint. <laughs> I mean, there's there's so much there's so much more, and uh, the whole idea of, of of lunar Crete and the fact that it, you could basically build a, a lunar base out of almost everything that's already there, and you just need a few rare materials that you, that you wouldn't find there, and obviously you have to bring water and other things. But there's water there, so maybe you can drill for that first. I don't know. Make all that together, because if you're going to stay there any length of time, you're certainly going to need. A kind of shielding that's not currently available yeah. uh, and if we can make a big enough uh, bunch of lunar blocks uh, to make a habitat that uh, is that we're gonna have to go underground we're gonna have to be very clever because right now we can't live there so so a lot of these technologies are fabulous and they're gonna be great and we're they're gonna be absolutely necessary well, but now? they're like 10 15 30 50 years in the future how do we what do we do now to enable those technologies to happen when we need them I'd say the Obama, most. I think that's one, one thing Obama did is it re, he's cut back on manned space programs. He wants to put NASA back in research mode and make them do that research to accomplish those things. So I think that's part of the reason some of the funding is heading that direction as opposed to manned space flight. Yeah, even uh, the Brad Maxwell wasn't wasn't charged with um, with inventing TV. He was just doing research and he discovered. Electromagnetism, <laughs> and we don't have people paying for scientists to do that research as much anymore. Right. I, I'd say there's an elephant in the living room uh, with, with regard to all of this, and that is uh, if you want to focus on one technology, one thing that would change the game and would enable a lot of stuff that is just not happening and hasn't happened for decades. You need to do something about the cost of transportation, the cost of getting to orbit. Yep. Right now, it's it, it costs, depending on who, who you launch with, in the neighborhood of $10,000 a pound to get something up there. And if you think in those terms, uh, that means it's going to cost you $10,000 to fetch a pound of something back. Yeah. At, at those prices, it better be gold. Because <laughs> nothing else you can work in that. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So uh, that's what's that's the primary driver. If you can lower the cost of transportation, things just start to happen. And you need a non-hydrocarbon launch vehicle. Whether it be ion drives or something from, from um, something can fly in the atmosphere. Well, I, not not hydrocarbon. I challenge that, and the reason that's I would right challenge right. that Perfect. is the amount of energy in terms of fuel burned and the amount of energy it takes to get a, a vehicle into orbit is roughly the same as the amount of energy it takes to fly across the Atlantic. And it does not cost $10,000 a pound to get from here to London. So the, it's, it's a technology. It is not, it is not purely what we burn or, or any, anything of that nature. Now, it's if, not just chemistry. Yeah, it's not just chemistry. Uh, it, it is uh, the whole enchilada. It's the whole operational uh, cycle from cradle to grave of the spacecraft. How much does the spacecraft cost? Uh, when you throw away half your spacecraft every flight, uh, you know you don't throw away your car every time you drive to the grocery store. So reusability is something a lot of people think about and talk about, and uh, that would probably be part of a very important technology to develop. Online, they mentioned venture capitalists and getting an upstart with venture capitalism in this space. I think we're going to have the most useful thing that's going to come out of SpaceX's uh, near term flights is we've had a history, and it would take a good half hour to go through the history of, of way too many stops and starts, both on the government side and, and people who were pre-selling pre their capabilities. I think venture capital follows, they'll follow a good idea, but they have to follow a business plan that makes sense. Yeah. The biggest problem today is they haven't had a business plan that made sense. And as soon as you see someone succeed, you change the game. The reason that SpaceX is going to be so important, not only because NASA is not going to have the money in the near future 
um, to do all the things that it needs to do. And when is it ever? Since the 1960s. We're, we're going to be in a position that if they're going to explore the frontier, someone's got to be hauling the mail. And when we prove that someone can haul the mail, venture capitals will follow a, a successful business plan. If they can see at least one succeed, where many, many have failed, uh, you'll, you'll see venture enter in an entirely different way, venture capital. And so it, I think it will open up. Launch program, launch companies now. Z launch is successful. C-Launch is not successful. C-Launch just emerged from bankruptcy. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are. There still I think exist. This, this comment is really good about what the business case is, because, you know, all the companies, and it's been said before, all the companies that, are, that have been dealing in space since history are commercial companies. The point of the driver is the business case. Yeah. And there is no business case. So because there's no business case, there's no venture capital. And it's a chicken and egg situation that's fed, that's fed in a destructive cycle off of itself. Bigelow is waiting for someone who can deliver his, 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 his items on orbit, but we haven't had that yet. And we haven't had that yet, so he can't get going. With the, all it takes is one block of ice to get chipped out of here, and the rest of the glacier can start to break off in pieces. But until we see this happen, and we're finally on the verge of it happening, the game hasn't changed. We're on the edge of the game changing, and we need to be ready. So I want Texas to be ready to host all of what's coming next. Because why, why let that go somewhere else? So venture capital will have an important part to play, and they're on the verge. They're getting up tight wet. It's unfortunate that it took so many difficult paths, and that's the history we take a half hour explaining why we aren't there already. Because technologically, we were there 10, 20 years ago. Um, but now we're finally going to see the game change, in my opinion, and uh, we're going to we're going to have a, an entirely different way of talking about commercial space. That's actually one of the things from my perspective. It seems like we've been on the cusp of this for oh, at least time. a decade, if not like almost three. Um, what what do you guys think is different now that's going to enable that to finally get off the edge and and get that that ball rolling, I guess, if you will. What do you guys see as the the game changers that's gonna that are going to enter the field that are going to enable this? Obviously, low cost launch vehicles is a huge part of it. What can we do to enable that? <laughs> Isn't that the, well, the, the well, yeah, as a society? What we can do? What we've also made very difficult is, you know, the, the FAA and, and and different organizations have not viewed. Uh, what were considered the upstarts of commercial space in a favorable way. They, right. they, they weren't. We talked about. I just talked about 100 hurdles. They were adding more. Not FA specifically. We considered this, and, and it is. And there's no doubt about it. This is a very difficult and dangerous business. Okay. We deal with very high energy systems. We're dealing with something that, in the entire history of humanity, we've only been doing for half a century or less. So it's really brand new. We're still. As far as this goes as a technology, we're still infants crawling on the ground. It seems like we've lived a long time doing it, at least I have, uh, and it seems like this has been around a long time, but when you really think of how long we've been doing this, it's very, very short in the scale of human endeavors. It's not surprising that we don't have this uh, perfected yet or, or even gotten past the baby chemical propulsion problem, and that's really, as the gentleman said, is the big driver. But we, we now have them understanding that there is a new there is a new way of doing business. Now they are partners with the commercial businesses. They are trying uh, to do what they can to remove obstacles to getting them licensed, to making uh, everything happen in the most effective way possible. That doesn't mean there are still roadblocks. And one of the things we talked about with AIAA and we've been talking about it for the last 10 or 15 years, what happens if shuttle slams into New York? Well, the government's self-insured. If it blows up half the country, then it's responsible for it. The problem with commercial providers is, you know, you have a very high-speed vehicle flying around uh, the edge of the earth, and if it doesn't go where it's supposed to, you can get a certain amount of third-party liability insurance. That's just one of the examples. We've been talking to the national legislature for 10, 15 years about this problem. You can only get so much, and these uh, fledgling companies making a business case can only buy so much insurance up to a certain level. And beyond that, what do you do? Beyond two and three and four billion dollars, Will the government indemnify what you cannot get under uh, in a marketable way for insurance? There are, there are 100 little things, and the problem is we're right at the beginning, even though this seems like forever coming, 
you it's and I, I, I'm sorry, San Antonio Spurs fan. The coach of San Antonio Spurs said he teaches his players by saying you hammer away on a rock, and it seems like you're doing nothing for ten thousand times, and then ten thousand one time you hit it, and the whole thing shatters. People have been hitting on this rock and trying to solve all these problems a little bit at a time. You get frustrated as you know what, and I know that because I've been doing this for fifteen years, and it seems like you get nothing done, and then finally everyone's working together, enough hammers on there, and then the whole thing shatters. Where I think we have reason to be happy that we're at the edge of watching the stress thing build in this rock to the point where it's going to be a different a different day. And uh, with luck and with all of us trying to make that future happen, I think we're going to get there. The thing, the thing I'm interested in, one thing I'm interested in is it seems like the FAA is kind of taking up, like taking taking the role that maybe NASA should be, like, the FAA write, writes, writes regulations and proposes and advocates for legislation and all that, but but the FAA doesn't have the experience that NASA does, and 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 it seems seems to me like that, that NASA could become the FAA of space industry, and and they have they have more experience and more knowledge of what works and what doesn't, and they work with the FAA with a lot of stuff they do, so they a lot of this stuff can be transferable. It seems as far to as regulation goes, it seems like they're going to have to do some kind of a combination between the FAA and NASA because a lot of the, the regime goes right. through where FAA man, or, right. you know, regulates. But I think so, I think you're right in that that's going to be something that's up and coming is sort of a, an air traffic control system for the space environment. And we do that right now just so we can decide who, so decide if somebody is shooting a missile at us or some little rock is going to hit one of our... Uh, our spy satellites, but we don't do it as like a, an op a, in open in in open out in the open air type of thing like the air traffic control is. It's something that people don't really know about, so they're not confident in it. They don't have yeah, they don't have confidence in it, and so they don't have any idea of what it takes, and they're not going to be studying to to want to want to do that. They can track a lot of the large objects. They're having a lot of trouble with a lot of the smaller objects that are up they're there. Getting better. They are getting better, but they're and always there's going to be a certain point where it's just not going to work. Unless we're out, unless we're out there and spotting, and there's going to be you know, <laughs> things that uh, need to widen. We're just going to have to say you're just going to have to move. We can't tell you why. You just got to move. Yeah, you just got to go with that. Yeah. And there are a lot of spacecraft up there these days that don't actually have the capability to them. There are a lot of satellites that are passively controlled that just that they're in their orbit and they're going and that that's that's all she wrote. So a lot of the university satellites, for example, don't have any active control systems. Yeah. Right. So they can't steer. <laughs> oh, but those are I don't want to call them more expendable. Yeah, that's a good word. Right. <laughs> <laughs> lower priority. Yeah, lower priority. That's a good word. That's a better word. I like that word. That's, that's a little better, word. I guess. No, I think the, the, the secret satellite. Um, yes. It seems like there's a business case and opportunity right there for uh, the world. I mean, the smaller satellites are going to be used in the future. Yeah. Right. Well, high, highest level of interest, I, I, I would say, is uh, the future for launch systems to provide the, uh, the satellite service. Yeah. I'd, I'd say there's probably about 500 uh, satellites at any given time, small satellites, are waiting in, in for their opportunity to be launched. But at the same time, uh, those the systems that are designed for things like commsats or large payloads and only launch several dozen times a year. Do you really uh, think it's that many? That there really are 500 that yeah. are sort of waiting oh, in the yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess I went in there with that proposition and, and talking to other organizations, it seemed like it was rather consistent. We were able to locate one organization that had 100 satellites in the constellation. Isn't that what ESA is doing in Guyana? And uh, and uh, the, 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 the smaller uh, uh, launch pads that they're building? Well, I don't think much of anybody's doing anything about it. I think at one time, uh, uh, Elon Musk had introduced uh, the Falcon uh, 1 as a, as a solution to the small satellite proposition, but uh, due to market forces, his own resources, I think he tried, uh, yeah. he went went to replace the Delta 2, which uh, doesn't really help the uh, small satellite community. No. There have well, been so a lot of people who That's tried. a business case argument too, right? Right. I, mean, I was in a business trying to replace the Delta 2. Because okay. it had anchor tenancy, 12 launches a year, it could sustain itself, mm -hmm. flying these marvelous interplanetary payloads. 
There are four Delta IIs which are in the barn that cannot be sold because they're too expensive. So why are you building a market to replace something that you can't even fly anyway that exists? The problem is, it takes too much energy to get going 17,000 miles an hour safely. And it's not half your vehicle, it's like 3% of the vehicle that actually gets to work. All right, I follow you so far, except that uh, the Delta II actually eclipsed the Titan II. The Titan II was Air Force funded. It was a re refurbishment of uh, uh, missiles and silos, and uh, they couldn't compete with the Delta II. It seems like what's happened is that under the same auspices, Elon Musk has been able to replace another competitor because he can underbid them. Okay. I ran the Titan II program for a while, and depending on the market and what you're building, uh, it, it all depends on how, really, that's really sensitive to rate. If you can fly something six or eight times a year, it can be phenomenally more effective. It's still very expensive. Mm -hmm. right, so we were flying Titan IIs for $25 million a piece, lost competition to Deltas because they were going to be $17 million a piece. Delta IIs are over 60 now, probably over 100, because the rate's low. Mm -hmm. Same thing will happen to Elon. Okay. And a lot of this is because the, the market moved away from Delta II. NASA was making a lot of more payloads Delta II size. Well, NASA moving more towards. Yeah, NASA kept the payloads in the Delta II size to keep the rate up, which was a prudent decision to get the launch cost to, to curb the launch costs. But the technology issue, we don't have a better propulsion system that doesn't cost us so much to get to orbit. Yeah. And then at, on Titan II, and then Athena after that trying to get the launch of about three or 4,000 pounds in the low Earth orbit for less than 20 million. We were targeting 10, could not get it to 10. But even as we were trying to get it to 10, the Russians are selling Rokot for six. One a year at six million. What year was that? In the uh, mid-90s. Okay. Well, one factor about the, the, uh, the Russian example, at any rate, is they were coming off of the uh, command economy to a market with I bet that the, uh, the scale is going to tip more and more as, as time passes. In the worst direction, right? right. They'll, Not get, necessarily. They'll, get, they'll get more expensive, right? Well, yeah. well the Russian uh, uh, alternative would be, I mean, if they yeah. can't uh, buy, or if they can't order the Ukraine to supply the parts, for example, <laughs> it's, it's going to be a little more At costly. No cost, right? yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, it's challenging. I mean, I think the whole problem is, where's, where's the business case to be able to close on the market? Because all the guys in the business would love to build this hardware and fly it. It's marvelously fun to launch things. But it takes too many hours to make sure it's going to work. And you mentioned safety being one thing. I think there's going to be, you get into the human commercial space, but there's going to be a very fine line between safety and, and risk because the more you add safety to a vehicle, the heavier it gets. I mean, Orion has run into this problem. That launch board system is 8,000 pounds by itself. It's 17. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, 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 I think they initially started at eight. It, it got no, up a no, lot. No, it's Orion, currently deputy program manager in Orion. Okay. It's right on its mass targets. We have typical growth, you know, management of mass control. I mean, it's an issue. But we're right on all of our targets. We're designing Orion to about three thousand requirements. Yeah. Encompassing what you're saying to be safe and to not land on New York. Got a cast truck, cast truck, cast. But, but people fly all the time in airplanes. You don't give everybody an ejection seat in a suit and a chute. So, yeah. but you have emergency slides. So, but you can't use them for the more fun. Right. You can. They just want right. D. You can do it. The, the risk profile is going to have to be very, very different in a commercial environment, I think, than the one yeah. that it's been the NASA standard for so many years. But can you get, and I guess maybe it's, it's a, a realm that actually can do that because they're not going to be as potentially um, responsible to the general public. So can, they, can you walk that fine balance between adopting a riskier posture so that you can keep costs down while still maintaining confidence in your system? It's going to be a really interesting challenge. Once again, the first, the first, the first success will, will snowball everything else. Exactly. And I mean, I guess, I guess, uh, was it Virgin Galactic and and their 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 enterprises? If they if they succeed, then it's going to start snowballing. But we're still waiting, and I mean, I'm sure they're making progress. But what do we do in the meantime? Well, keep in mind, even on Virgin Galactic, you said you're an orbital mechanic. The you know suborbital velocity is totally yeah. three percent. Yeah. 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 
And there's, there's, there's further to go. They're playing in the cost effectiveness by 30 and see if you're still cost effective. Now, you mentioned risk and trade off, and uh, I just want to bring this up. You will probably hear more about it tonight straight from the horse's mouth, uh, but I want to mention uh, when I looked into uh, SpaceX and the design decisions they made with regard to uh, um, the Falcon vehicles and their whole program, um, you know, the thing that impressed me the most about that organization, I, I, I mentioned the, the elephant in the room being cost and how they had this huge focus on cost. But if you look at every single design decision they made in, the, in that vehicle, practically, um, their strategy was we are going to reduce cost by increasing reliability and safety. And if you look at uh, pretty much every decision they made, whether or not to go with uh, high pressure, you know, pressurized uh, uh, engines or uh, pressure fed engines or turbine fed engines, for example, that decision was made on which version would be more reliable and more safe. So I think we're, we're seeing, taking existing technology, we're seeing that taken about as far as it can go in the direction of safety and reliability. Well, yeah, that's one of the teams. huge way to control costs. Dylan mentioned was uh, using the same architecture, you know, the architecture that Boeing's using. Well, maybe we would adopt the same architecture for all the space programs, all the space vehicles, manned, unmanned, kind of a good one. Cost. Oh, that'd be because awesome. Like that. Modular for everything. That's what he's Mod modular, modular, scalable, mm -hmm. everything. Scalable, scalable. Yeah. There's, there's one other way to look at this too, I think, and it's not it's not to cast a, aspersions on anything, it's just the way that it's been. And uh, I'll use this as an example because I think it's a good analogy. <clears throat> we had been in a shuttle mindset or a lunar mindset and where you had an amazing group of, of uh, flight controllers and, and backroom folks and a huge army who stayed dedicated to the smallest level of detail and telemetry and, and all of the kinds of operations that go on. When we set up for a space station, the same mindset that 24-7, 365 days a year, we have to monitor whether that bit is flipped on something completely irrelevant. And, and but, but we have to stay on every single thing as though every one of them will blow up the spacecraft. When the Russians who had been doing that for 10 or 15 years kind of went, okay, sure. And <laughs> they were kind of like, okay, they'll change their mind. And I think it would be fair to say that over time, you'll now look where there was a full suite of controllers all the time, 24-7. Now there's one person ha handling two and three consoles with the Gemini system, there's an awful lot of ways that once it becomes normalized and routine, that you find out, yeah, verily, you didn't need to monitor in the way that you thought you absolutely had to, because if you went to a safety guide and said, no, I have to monitor this every minute or we'll all die. And, and that's, not, that's not bad, that's just the only way we had ever done business. And that's the mindset that I think we will lose. Not, not lose to, to, to catastrophic nature, but not everything is equally important or nothing is important. So we, we will begin to separate out what absolutely is important to the true safety and operation of things and what we have always said we had to do, but what they really added to safety and, and capability was much less the amount of energy and time we spend either tracking it in a quality assurance way or requiring it to be done in a ground launch way. There's just there's thousands of those little things and we have only come up through the NASA way of doing it and that's all we've known and that's a very expensive gold-plated Cadillac way of doing stuff. And that isn't to knock NASA, that's the way we did things. And with the lunar stuff, it was much more required. When we're in low Earth orbit and running 24-7 in operations on the space station, it's a different animal. I think what we're going to begin to find is, as other people can operate and safely, all the things that 3,000 rules for Orion and God knows how many safety and quality assurance things that are stamped off, remember they used to say 1,000 signatures, a million signatures or whatever it was, and how much safety are we adding? You get back to that. When we see people operate um, these newer vehicles, we have a we, we follow their engineering, we understand what they're doing, we see them operate safely, we'll go, you know what? We have always required for the last four years that every single thing do that. Well, maybe that really wasn't as required as we thought it was. <laughs> so we're going to be relearning uh, the entire enterprise of doing space operations, especially in low Earth orbit. And I think we'll find operators that can do things differently and having NASA have another 
test case, uh, test proof that says you can do things this way and it can work will help both sides uh, do better. And I think uh, we can learn from each other, commercial and, and government, and then maybe we can find ways to save money all around. And, and that's the best case side of, of the possibilities that can come out of what we're going to do. Right now there's a cultural phenomenon yeah. of risk avoidance, and oh, yes. that's going to be, I think, the hardest thing to change at NASA. Well, that's the interesting part. Governments, and this is not a knock on government, governments are set up to be bureaucratic in nature, which is to control risk. That, right. That's what bureaucrats are, and everybody spits bureaucrats like they're mean. They're to control risk and remove risk from, uh, entrepreneurs have an entirely different mindset mm -hmm. of what, what uh, accomplishment and success is. Yeah. And they're going to learn a lot from each other. And I'm still talking. And, and I, agree, I agree with what you're saying, but you've got to get some entrepreneurial-based operations. That's one of our highest costs. Yeah. Um, the thing about what happened to space station freedom, see, I said freedom, that was before the International Space yeah. Station. The space station freedom was designed to operate at 20 and a half degree inclination yeah. on the orbital mechanic. And what happened is, is that yes. we had to go, yeah. for whatever reason, we got in there with the Russians to build the space station. Uh, yeah. It's because the wall fell. We didn't want to okay. do this. And uh, so we got in bed with the Russians to operate the space station. But we didn't take the time to go back and redesign our vehicle that we designed to fly at 20 and a half degree inclination to fly at 51.6. Oh, so consequently, there's all kinds of thermal, all kinds of issues thrown lies. And I was in meetings where they were saying, well, we can't go redesign it, so we're just going to say, well, in three years, we know that component's going to burn out, so we're going to fly spare parts. So that's what they've been doing, is flying spare parts of the station. And so I think a lot of that goes back to you've got to be really smart about your uh, design your vehicle, what environment you're going to fly in it. If you're going to change your environment, you've got to, take, you've got to embrace the pain and go back and change your, uh, your design. The other thing about the Russians is that they were in a, they, when Mir was flying, the only time they communicate with Mir is when it flew over the ground sites. So they got in the mindset that, okay, well, we're going to have six hours a day, we're not going to have communications. So they had to build their vehicle to do that. Whereas the space station, we have the luxury of Tedris. We have constant communication, maybe, gosh, 20 minute LOS, my gosh, what are we going to do? We're going to work the rest of us. Yeah, bathroom, exactly. And, uh, so anyway, so there's, you've got to look at your, uh, not only your business case like this general said, but your whole mission profile, mission plan, all kind of goes together. You've got to make sure you're designing your vehicle. Kind of I agree if we, could go between, if we could go from a complete, utter control of every variable to just a, main, just a maintenance role, like like, uh, like an F-16 crew, uh, the turn, turnaround is like less than 20 minutes. And, but they're not, they're not afraid that the whole thing is going to break, break down if, it takes 14 minutes instead of 20, or it takes 30 minutes. They're, they're not, they're confident in, in their systems because they've been tried and tested and it didn't break this time, so there's a however, however percent chance that it's not gonna break next time. So we have yet, yet to design one of these things intelligently enough to know that it's gonna break down we have yet to design, and NASA, for example, has yet to write the proper requirements to get the right design on the table, right. because everything we do takes so long, by the time we get to this point, well, now we want this. I mean, my job is almost 100% write mod kit procedures to go rewire our space station. You know? Requirements creep. Anyway, I mean, it takes so long to get to this point, so well, now we want this and this and this and this, and oh, well, we didn't really word that right, we really need this. You know, and, and you gotta, that's great, Derek, how do we? Applied system engineering, you know, I mean, that's where it gets yep. all back to. Good system engineering, uh, good requirements. Uh, you gotta, yeah. you gotta pay your taxes early on. And like the gentleman, your architecture, you gotta get that squared, you gotta get your requirements done. And that, nobody wants to do that. Yep. We wanna build, we wanna burn this, we wanna Well, we have to have right some for it. We have to have some show for it today. Because yeah. we're losing. We're always on the cusp of losing the attention of the public. Because no one's going to put venture capital. And there's nothing to sustain it. Well, that's why yeah. it needs to be look, commercial. Look, because you need to get the politics yeah. out of it. You've got, you got to raise the pain. Understand what kind of requirements for, you know, maybe build for it. Your schedule may build for 18 months. That's your from. Okay, this is what we're going to build. Okay, we've got 18 months to build it. You spend the other, you know, Two or three years take sometimes to work on requirements. Yep. Do 
um, Quirm, simulations, Quirm, Quirm. do uh, a CAD, just things like that, case, it's electronically first before you start bending them. That's a hard, we're not, well, yeah. <laughs> that's not our mindset. Well, with, with the aircraft industry still in space. One nice well, thing with venture be, capital, that's, that's anti-mindset. You know, venture capital looks for a quick return. Yeah, that's right. true. But it also has a business plan. But I, I, I kind of wonder if the systems engineering is mostly a documentation of the process between the government and contractors. Because at one time, for instance, a DC-3 could way. be described in one page write-up, and then uh, Douglas would go ahead and build it. It was, a, it was, it was yeah. for accountability purposes. And it's because yeah. it was a, they had simple requirements, well-written. I don't know. They're probably well-written, quite simple. And, uh, you know, we've been flying planes before. Yeah, uh, yeah but if DC-3 were built today, would we uh, proceed with a one-page uh, definition of it, or would it be, be, be something about we have to truck into the room? Well, <laughs> short <laughs> short 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 short. Yeah. And that's something you got to be careful with. When you write the requirements, you got to scrub them, you got to be careful, you got to write your rationale. You just can't write every little detail down. You've got to be very specific. Because it seems like a lot of our energy right now is uh, the documentation. Yeah. Back, back on the DC-3, too, they had the little three pages, but you didn't have, you know, excuse me, guys, all the engineers in the room with their focus of doing it this way. They had people who learn by doing, by okay. they were building the airplane, and they move up to help design it. The first few are works of art. And so they had... They didn't have the, the book learning, the engineer that has a mindset, and again, excuse me, I've seen engineers step over a 20 to pick up a nickel. And because there's no one in there to, to throw something at them to change their way of thought. You know, I, you know, I'm sorry, I, I come from finance background and entrepreneurship background and from a different industry, right? And uh, this is a fascinating discussion, particularly sort of some of the things that were mentioned sort of across the room here. Uh, just teeing off of SpaceX's example that was highlighted by Wayne a little bit earlier, um, I've seen their valuation just jump, you know, double, triple, quadruple over the last two years, right? So now they're, uh, by some estimations, a couple of billion dollar company of the private and private space yet. Um, how long before someone else sort of jumps in? Uh, it's, it's a very interesting question to ask. How long before private equity and venture capital and you know well capitalized entrepreneurs well, just thing with spacex jump in. elon had a big pocketbook and there are several yeah. with that order of magnitude and so is jeff bezos and the, right now it's the, right. the business case has been run by uh, the uber wealthy that's really the only way you have to do it with your own money because the uh, now people with good ideas but no money will have opportunities yeah. to get in, exactly. be, be, yeah. to have entrance into the game too. But up until now, it's been angels. It's because they can so survive. Angel investors are the only way. Combination of, of the money and that. I mean, he's got a drive to, to do this. I mean, he's not. Well, but but I kind of question how cheap SpaceX is going to stay. They're a young company. They haven't built a bureaucracy yet. But so you know, they want if there is no competition to them, oh, right? Well, at the end of it. It, it depends. So I think going back to the point, I think it, the, the, the price point tends to go in the direction of, of demand supply. So it attracts, you know, what's the demand out there. There are 500 satellites waiting to be launched and not enough supply of these launchers. Obviously, you will have the you know, price tend in yeah, that direction. But, but, it, but I mean, even, even if all that, that goes right and, and he runs the, the business well, I mean, it's it's a startup. I mean, they're 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 they've got engineers. I, I interviewed with them a couple of years ago. The expectation was was that I was going to have to work 55 hours a week, and, and I mean, sure. I mean, you're you're getting uh, an extra. Uh, they can find point. that. What? Believe me, they can find that kind of stuff. They can I mean, find people who just graduated who yeah. uh, who got okay, rejected from Boeing or Lockheed Martin who probably who will work, work those ridiculous hours. Yeah, I mean, you, they, you they got the chance to do, do that, the job that they weren't allowed to do out there in uh, Lockheed Martin, Boeing, USA, just name a whole long list, Orbital probably. Yeah. And uh, they'll find it. But the thing is, is uh, he, I mean, for Elon to fail, he just has to blow up one of his flights. But if he doesn't, what happens then? You know? The, and, and another thing about economics, Elon said many times does. before that the way of doing the, I mean, sure. what he's trying to find is what is the minimum amount of money to send a manned vehicle into space because he's just copying the Russians right now. 
you know, a, he's just rolling that thing out, you know, like a, on a rail system, just like Soyuz. He's, he's uh, in, you know, using a cluster of engines as opposed to one expensive new engine. I mean, he's not doing anything exotic, you know. It, it, did, it did remind me a lot of Vostok and Soyuz. And yeah. It's like, wait a second, I've seen this video before. Exactly. <laughs> the, only thing, the only thing different is this guy can sell it to the public more than than NASA can. I mean, the way he does, the way he talks is almost like like uh, the guy on uh, Iron Man, you know. The stuff oh, like yes. That. Yeah, I mean, he, if he keeps living that persona, he gets more popularity. You can sell yeah. the well, simplicity. They actually, apparently, it's some, it's some, some, some of the scenes in the latest movie were actually from the SpaceX facility yeah. where you can make it out. But, I mean, you're always going to find people who are going to work 55 hours a week, but as his workforce grows, it's going to be harder and harder, and I mean, people are going to get burnt out. Well, you're you going to start getting the management the bureaucracy. Well, yeah. there. So his costs are going to go you know, up. A Lockheed bit. and Boeing were like garage startup companies like in the 1990s. Yeah, but now, I mean, both of those companies so, now, I, I work for yeah. well, yeah. yeah. them. I mean, you, you got a lot of bureaucracy Delphine, in there. And, and, I mean, as, as you establish processes, I mean, it, it's a lesson learned thing. I mean, it, you kind of like go, okay, you know, we really need a manager looking over this, and, and, that, and that kind of grows there. I mean, he, it's just that cost is it, going to go up a little bit, maybe more than expected. And, and so right now, yeah, SpaceX is dirt cheap, but I mean, if you look at the price of their launcher over the last couple of years of what they're advertising, it's been going up faster. Of course, it's, 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 it's basically it's, it's like a it's like a it's like a solver trying to converge to a solution. Yeah, you know. Yeah. He started out saying, okay, I'm gonna. I'm going to say that my prediction will be like five bucks. Okay, so and the true solution is probably way higher than that, like mm -hmm. 500 bucks. Yeah. And so he just does one iteration, and the next iteration it climbs up higher and gets closer. And it finally, it, but but then you start with the, the industry standard, which is inflated. Yeah. It's like, okay, it's going to cost you $50,000, right? Instead of, you know, the true answer is really $500. And so all, the, all we're doing is just as an industry converging towards a, a point where this is the bare minimum that we, it takes to launch something into space without it crashing and burning. But, but, but in reality, yeah, sorry, no, that's all the commercial really will do, I think. Uh, yeah. But in reality, I mean, I think the Lockheeds and Boeings of the world have a unique opportunity here, in yeah. my opinion, where they could, in fact, if they were to spin off a subsidiary or an initiative that actually came out with something that was relatively inexpensive and uh, met the right risk return sort of, you know, mindset and threshold. Perhaps this is a very unique opportunity for the established players to leverage their, uh, you know, technology, wisdom, call it what you will. Experience. Yeah, that's so true, because maybe the technology they need is not the hardware, but the management of it to get the price down. Really, and, and I think that's where Boeing and Lockheed have a hard time, because, I mean, I mean they've got this big established business and now you've got to go, I mean, and that's what makes them expensive. That's I mean, the business. Really, they they want it's where culture gets in the way. And so you Do either want to talk about the you split the something <laughs> off and say, okay, it's you big. guys are going to work on this. I can and, see. and so, yeah, you get down to something like the size of SpaceX, they, they can make it work. But you've got all these people in this business saying, hey, I want to do that. You've got all these managers say, hey, I need to be involved in this. And, and so it, it's hard to get that kind of break off there. I, I, this, this is a, this, I'll, I'll mention the elephant. Um, yes, Boeing is doing what you're saying. The CST-100, the, the new capsule that they're doing, is going to be their entrance into this new shave down world. The real, I, I agree completely with what you said. The point of this is to bring it all down from a taxpayer perspective. That's a great idea for all of us, right? The, the, the real issue here is, and I, I, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is a perfect lead way to this. You. Boeing and Lockheed Martin have unique expertise, okay? They are, hey, they've grown the way they are because of their customer. And that is not a knock on NASA, but it is a way to say there's a lot of engineers at NASA that keep changing the requirements yes. Oh, yes. on a rolling basis. And we all know the stories about this. The, the reason why Elon Musk can keep, and others can keep this kind of cost control. pressure on is they simply don't have to play that game. Yeah. They know exactly what they're aiming at, they're going to do it at this price per unit, and that's what they're going to produce. If you want it at the end of the game, NASA, here, you can use it. If you don't, then I've created this. You'll either come to this, or you can go use whatever other system. That's the way that you keep costs in, uh, in, in reasonable order. The, the reason, I mean, the, the, the Defense Department learned this a long time ago. 
you can't keep changing the cost with uh, the requirements without changing the cost. So they write f much closer to fixed price contracts that say, this is what you'll deliver. It may not be the state of the art, and by the time you deliver it, maybe we would prefer this. But we're not going to change it on the 11th hour and go, oh, well, wait a minute, now we have a fancy new computer. We need to integrate that into the thing. So just redo it all again and try to come near somewhere near the same cost. There's been no requirement to keep the cost down, and we're, we're agency staffed with engineers who love to change things. So that is the difference between what the commercial guys will do is they will bring the the uh, firmness of this is the product and it will cost this and and as we found out when you said Dell's four minutes ago they'll find a way to use your product instead of continually evolving their product yeah. uh, they'll come up with the, the next when you know when this one is no longer it then there'll be version model this and it will have the new upgrades we're not going to have a shuttle evolving concept and, and, and you can't make a commercial business case with that it just can't work what Lockheed Martin and Boeing can do the with their unique capabilities is there's always the frontier which needs the absolute state of the art, best, best materials, therefore most expensive things on a, when you're out at the pointy end of the spear going to the moon and going to Mars where, where every ounce matters. That's different from getting the lower orbit on a dumb booster. Okay, there, this is just an entirely different thing. That's that's the part that I'm I'm loving living through. The, this is where NASA shakes the hand of the baby Leo launch business and say, "We gave birth to you. We've watched you grow up 30 years. It's time to leave the house." And they should declare victory because they have produced a victory, making low Earth orbit within the technological means of any kind of reasonable business case person who knows how to do, run a space. Now they need to spend all their time and energy and declining dollars doing the most important things, which is setting a, a, a new fort on the new frontier. That's going to be difficult and expensive enough. And Lockheed Martin and Boeing have a bunch of people who know how to do really neat stuff like that. Well, and that's like where I think we're going to end up differentiate. Uh, for instance, well, maybe 20 years ago, I, I'd be participating in uh, so-called architecture studies, and there would be six or seven contractors who were offering their version of the future. Yeah. Now it seems like, uh, as you say, it's uh, Lockheed Martin or Boeing that's uh, suggesting where we're going to go in the future. Mm -hmm. One time the telephone, or I guess telecommunications in this country was all AT&T. It wasn't yep. any alternative. There used to be those stickers that say, we don't care, we don't have to. <laughs> <laughs> and then I guess there was regulation, the deregulation, okay. where the, uh, in the industry was broken up. <laughs> and maybe it's just a coincidence, but we seem to have a lot more telephone uh, alternatives now in the, the type of communications you can use. And the price drop. And same yeah. in energy, by the way. I mean, well, this is the story of deregulation time and again. Yeah. It, it injects competition. It allows everyone to... Well, 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 well the government doesn't have any motive to deregulate it because they can work with these two big companies and they know how to... Do. To break, they send things in the other direction to create more small companies that are competing against each other in, in this particular sector. Well, that, that works with the telephone company because there's 300 million customers. Mm -hmm. How many customers are there for Boeing and Lockheed? Well, uh, it's kind of a national problem. Uh, how, 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 many, how many uses are there of space? And if they all have to go through one, one or the, the other company, Beginning of our discussion. Uh, <laughs> it, it, it's, all around. it's like riding a ferry where you build a bridge. So the natural question, I think, that you're tending towards is a very interesting question. Are we going to see... Uh, the telecom players uh, and those who are heavy users of uh, space uh, presence Resource, yeah. actually start, uh, you know, as, as the cost of satellite building come down, new technologies coming up, yep. will they start tending to take equity position in such place? That's a very interesting uh, I'm debate. Surprised they haven't already. I'm glad you brought that up because I was going to mention earlier, uh, if if all government spending on space ceased tomorrow, there would still be a space industry, and it would be the telecom industry. That's the only thing that's going. Um, yeah, I mean, today, that, that would still be there. Well, the navigation's government thing. Mm -hmm. But it could be, it could, could be outsourced to the yeah. telecommunications industry. <laughs> yeah. So you're starting to see a little bit of, of satellite imagery, commercial. Yeah. Or commercial satellite, the rapid eyes of the world government doesn't provide weather forecasting, uh, then uh, somebody else will have to, and then they pay for the, the product. Exactly. You, you might see some convergence there, perhaps. But, but, I mean, again, I think going back to the question of uh, with SpaceX's valuation, the, the way it has skyrocketed 
I think that will attract entrepreneurs. It will attract. Yeah, it, uh, it demonstrates that that there is that there is a workable model somewhere that that you can build, and it, it's going to happen. And we have. It's not just. It's not necessarily just waiting for it to happen. We have to make, <laughs> make it happen. <laughs> It's cause for optimism. I'd like to ask you, do you think there are regulatory barriers to investment in space business? And the reason I ask that is uh, if an individual has a net worth of half a million dollars, according to the government, he is incompetent to, to invest one dollar with SpaceX. You have to be an angel investor at this stage Qualified of the game. Investment yeah. I yeah. think you're, huh. that's an interesting point. Um, but I mean, if SpaceX was going public, for example, that would be different. You would be awesome. able to. Um, <laughs> yeah. So it's yeah. Uh, I mean, you have to be a qualified investor to be able to participate in private, you know, uh, funding rounds. And uh, I, I don't see that changing, uh, particularly in the current economy. Well, yeah. uh, but uh, but you, I, I, th I think you will see uh, entities mature over the next three to five years, seven years, over the next decade where private investors, just like you can buy a share of Lockheed Martin or Boeing today, uh, it should be very natural that, that that should be the logical progression. I, I think some of those regulations wow. will get in the way. I mean, one, one big thing that has taken in, here, in, in the last several years is um, point scoring <laughs> venue. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it, it, that's, that's a powerful uh, venue, but a lot of states, it's only uh, legal in like 23 states or something like that. You can't loan money from Texas uh, unless, or you can't do it period in Texas, and then you go to other states and the regulations are unless you have like $30,000 or verifiable net worth, you can't loan $50 mm -hmm. to Joe down the street. I mean, that, that's just ridiculous. But I mean, if, if yeah, that's a good point. I guess startup companies had access to that sort of thing, I mean, space is such a, I mean, like this, this space up event, I mean, if a company said, hey, you know, would you loan us twenty dollars on, on this wild goose chase? I mean, a lot of people will, are, would be willing to risk twenty dollars to invest yeah, in a company easily, yeah. or, or this type of company just to see if it would happen or not. So, uh, another powerful venue. It, it, I mean, this is how space of uh, Houston got started, but Kickstarter too. I, at least that's that's more of just a grant versus a loan. So there, I don't think there's any government right. regulation. You can always give somebody money. There, but that, 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 that's a problem. <laughs> I think that the that regulations where the, the government has decided that unless you have a certain amount of, come, of money, you can't invest like that. It, it's just ridiculous. But there is also a lot of pension uh, funds. I, I mean, very large pension funds are interested in this to some extent. But I guess their policies may vary. But with some things may be high risk for one group, but it would be a different story for another. I understand a little bit probably why tell me more about that. Yeah. 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 No, I think lots of cash is sitting oh, out there. You're absolutely right. That I mean, there's a lot of liquidity in the marketplace. That, that some people might be smart to, smart to take today. advantage of. And with Problem our current the thing is, the IRS moves with our current that. drive so towards why is there why is there what the administration is talking about? That is the logical next direction. If you are opening up space as a new frontier, if you will, mm -hmm. right? for, and, and for the masses, like pension funds will have a huge role to play, as will all the uh, you know the likes of Harvard Management Corp, uh, the Yale University Foundations, all, all of that. They have to ultimately sort of step in uh, with a public mandate. It's uh, it's imperative, I think, for that to happen. But it won't happen overnight. I think you'll have to see a few successes come out before they'll be able to invest in that. Minimum, minimum requirements. Exactly. But but one one thing that Peter mentioned is interesting. Uh, I, I think STEM is one area where, uh, from an education standpoint, you could attract. If you were sort of not for profit with a social mandate, mm -hmm. it was a social entrepreneurial sort of a move or initiative. I think that may you may not want or need because you're just making a donation for some sort of a psychic upside, if you will. Yeah, uh, that may actually you know, result in some blending of that uh, requirement, perhaps mm. for private initiatives. I mean, if you had like a started a company doing suborbital launches and, and made your primary or part of your customer base like like students, hey, send send me Can a sense. dollar and a yeah. coin and I'll launch this into space and send it back to you. The, 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 I, I saw on Space Week cast the guy the guy that um, that sends ping pong balls. 
Okay. Oh yeah, I think I've heard of yeah. The so ping pong ball experiment. You, yeah, you and did a little experiment inside the ping pong ball to launch it for like. For it's like it's, it's really it, cheap. I think I think, I think it's, it's either free. Or I think it's, it's free. For, it's free for some people. Like for some people, it's like like fifty dollars for a whole yeah. class classroom or something. Kyle Larson, and is that right? uh, I forgot the guy. It's the, he, he's the guy that, that 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 wrote floating floating to space. Mm -hmm. um, Right yes. into it once or twice, but I think it's John Powell. Yes. Powell. Right. Oh. But it's a phone. It becomes viable because you, suddenly your customer is huge versus. And if, if you charge oh, yeah. like $2 for that, yeah. it's. What time are we supposed to end? Yeah, that's a good question. I think 30 after, right? <laughs> well, does anyone else have the room? I think there was a. Something after Because I'll run out there and I'll, I'll slide the. <laughs> 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 it's a space show and tell. Yeah. yeah. Take a picture. Yeah. Oh, there was. Oh, yeah. There was a break. But there was a gap between the sessions. So yeah, it was just a gap. So there was a show and tell session. Mine's got a twenty minutes. Well, thank you all very much. This has been enlightening. Great. Much appreciated. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I really didn't mean to take over the whole thing. So no, we got you like a top. Don't don't start me spinning. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm gonna stop the recording.